welcome to another edition of Spirited Conversations with Spirited Leaders. My guest today is Dr. Vishal Sangale. He's a co-founder and CEO of TradeFit. He has 12 years of clinical and counseling experience with expertise in psychometric assessments. He's been awarded Young Scholar Award 2020 by International Test Commission, a world body that is responsible for creating policies, frameworks, setting guidelines for psychometric assessments. He's a member of American Psychological Association and Society of Industrial and Organizational Psychology USA, as well as Committee for Accreditation of Psychometric Tests, Indian Institute of Business Psychology, and an editorial board member for International Journal of MC Square Scientific Research. He is also a trainer in the field of emotional intelligence and OD interventions. Also, he is a mentor of change at Niti Aayog. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sangale, and uh, welcome to my channel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Yeah. All right. So I want to begin by asking, you had 12 years of clinical psychology experience, right? So yeah. what about psychology that excited you? Psychology for me is not, you know, restrictive to behavior. Okay. Uh, as what many behaviorists or maybe many neuro cognitive psychologists see it nowadays. Mm -hmm. I call myself as modern orthodox. Okay. Yeah, so, is... so psych for me, the basic foundation lies into the monuments of what you say, spirituality. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that context, also the meaning, the root meaning of the word psych is soul. So I, I resigned to the, to the, you know, clubbing of all these theosophical concepts to the psychological domain. In doing so, if you also read uh, what West has to offer in this context, mm. go back to Plato in maybe uh, 2000 years ago, he, you know, illustratively mentioned about the challenges that humans face, uh, the problems that humans have. And in doing so, he put forth uh, three problems. One is the political problem, other is the ethical problem, and the third is a psychological problem. Mm. And for all these problems, he prescribed a solution, which is psychological solution. Okay. And hence, uh, when we look at the current scenario of psychology, uh, the, the challenge is more towards the psychopathology that we seek. But my personal experience with psychology and with my numerous uh, clients that I you know, engage with, it has been more towards the positive aspect of it, which has been the bedrock for all of the Eastern philosophical streams that have emerged, uh, contributing towards the modern moment, what we see as mindfulness mm. these days. In that context, I really enjoy uh, dealing with uh, these aspects of individual when I, when I engage with them. One important thing I would like to highlight is this has been, my, my journey has also been inspired by, as I said, spiritual inclination. The more, what you say, fuel in the rocket was the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. And that uh, in early days of my college, I really, it changes the perspective of how, how you see humans, how you see the behaviors, how you see the, how they operate. And when I was able to read it in theory, I was largely influenced by practical aspect of it when I visited my Sadhguru in a very remote village in Maharashtra, central, central part of Maratwada. And then I saw how these concepts, how these nitty-gritties of day-to-day -day life are solved, how these uh, human potential can be explored, and how the tenets of consciousness can be elevated towards the profundity of uh, what we see in likes of like, say, Vivekananda or Jiddu Krishnamurti or say, uh, Rama, uh, Ramakrishna uh, Paramahansa. In, that, in, the, in the similar lines, I see a larger living idol standing in front of me and whom I was blessed to hear, touch, be in company of uh, Swami Priyatamananda. So that is, the, that is the real personal side of me. Uh, I hope like it, it, it is a little bit different from the corporate world that we see of yeah. even, you know, what, what uh, people aspire to be more scientific and uh, more uh, objective, empirical in their understanding. And I go towards more subjective, experience-driven understanding of how we have been moving around the globe. 
you're somebody who who sort of teaches emotional intelligence right but what is your own personal go to when you're feeling emotionally low or uh, when you when you feel like your emotions are challenged you have any interesting question also i personally resign to the foremost and uh, most contemplative way of human blessed you, you know all mankind is and that is uh, you'd laugh at it initially but it is sleep so if you look at if you look at how uh, humans have progressed and what are the energies that they try, derive from yeah. sleep i don't say a meticulous long lasting sleep uh, but on the occasions that have been uh, challenging one of the important things that you see and you must have been practicing earlier on is like a good habit of sleep which helps you to rectify the emotional turbulences uh one thing is sleep uh, so it's not like sleeping all the way you find that you are into uh, emotional uh, whirlwind but let's say you have cultivated a habit over a period of time that you sleep uh, good at night early early on rise early on and then you have demonstrated a good resilience among within your mind to catch up upon the challenges of uh, you know emotionality this is one thing second is i don't say uh, it's a difficult thing but nowadays people find it difficult and uh, cultivating that is important and that is forgiveness so any act of uh, you know emotional turbulence in your mind is majorly because you get hurt mm. or you that things that does not happen according to your will and then you're disturbed and you're her again the the sequence is same you must be reading bhagavad gita you look at the fourth chapter of bhagavad gita and gives you a it, it gives you a, a series of things that happens all through this one first thing happens is when like you have a desire you have certain you know expectation uh, that you put across that desire and the time you that find find that those expectations are not fulfilled you get a disappointment disappointment leads to either uh, sadness or anger eventually like corrupting your uh, intellect and this is the doom for that individual like you no know, the time your intellect starts corrupting degrading you are not able to grow with wisdom that is required so it all starts with that sense of uh, you know expectation for me uh, i have always been looking at it from the perspective of like if emotions prevail in that Uh, in that gray zone of uh, negativity it's better that you overcome it by uh, for forgiving them forgetting things overcoming those things belittling the the challenges that you see amongst people mm-hmm. majorly you see challenges occurring between people relationships yeah. so just just accept love develop compassion forgiveness all ultimately comes in so these are the two things i commonly resign to which has been which has been very very endearing also like uh, they have become a part of implicit uh, what do you say habitual thing that that has been ingrained i hope uh, i'm not uh, self praising but uh, things are things are such that uh, if you develop these kind of things it's easy to navigate through the challenges of life yeah, yeah. so the most uh simplest of things are available for us which we usually don't tap into we look at more complex things and think that the complex things will help us resolve all our problems this is a this is a common human tendency i guess uh, but it's fascinating you talked about habits in your own uh, experience right how important are these habits for people to develop i mean we know we know that people are coming out with books after books that talk about the importance of habit yet if you go back to our culture which says you know everything in our culture actually starts and ends with a habit uh, there is a ritual there is something that you need to follow like get up brush your teeth is something that is ingrained in us right so even from that standpoint if you are to look at how important are these habits uh, for you how it has helped you and of course by explaining your story also talk about a little bit on how others can actually inculcate this uh, as by, by and large habits are the building blocks of your i must say so your nature uh running through the behavior uh they impact your tendencies 
your tendencies by by tendencies i mean uh, in 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 hindi or marathi or sanskrit we call it as vrittis mm. and these vrittis are the tendencies that that is a combination of uh, thoughts emotions and habits uh, a naturalistic response in a, for a particular situation and these tendencies then you know as a part of your behavior practiced for a long period of time settles into your temperament and nature mm. then you say this man belongs to a particular nature or particular you know tendency or something the the building block for this is habit mm. and habit uh, is a trainable thing it's like pretty like you can drop off the mal adaptive habits adopt the more you know suitable habits to your circumstances to your yeah uh, you know uh, current life space situation your necessity to build something uh, to achieve a particular goal and all those so habits are you know pretty like trainable things mm. and they have a basis like you know they have a basis into your uh, now you can readily demonstrate a particular act practiced for a particular period of time actually develops a pathway a neuropsychological pathway which is which we usually call as neurological circuit and the circuits are responsible for again like triggering a particular behavior all together in in a, in a very uh, subtle and non aware format when you are not aware of a particular situation so if you ask me personally uh, some things uh, i i have uh, i have uh, been coming from a small village a small town you can say and although it had the 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 ability to connect with the town nearby but we lived in a what you can say a, a, a farm house what you can nowadays farm house comes with a lot lot long connotation but farm house in the sense i a, a, a mid, what you can say good house in the farm and then uh, while doing so our uh, my uh, i am going into 90s when when i was into my childhood uh, it was natural for us to play study and say engage with lot of people although a joint family however it is and and get along with small small things like you know uh, eating was not so much uh, beyond what you say nowadays you find outside into the into the uh, hotels and all those things it was homemade home home cooked food sleep was adequate uh, relationships was uh, profound and interactions with humans were so much so that for any subtle emotions you have someone to you know uh, come along with. so these came as a naturalistic triggers while i migrated to a uh, to pune and uh, i saw these helping me uh to to the best of my sustenance uh, i i continued with those habits i did not leave by like you know getting some peer pressure or say societal pressure so like you have societal cultural change and you have tendencies like people dine out people get into uh, night watching and all those things i deliberately resist doing those things so that my habit which is like lasting remains and this has been a this has been an effort in that direction i also encourage my clients patients to do so i i see a lot of books venturing into this domain people read it the missing link is how you curtail your desire to not to fall prey to those you know external things and cultivate mm-hmm. these habits on your own Yeah. Amazing. So, is there anything that you have resisted? Even <laughs> my, uh, I try to do on a daily basis some things. Take a take a case like you know, couple of days, three days back, I I'm trying to build this understanding that I should. So, there's a habit that I, which everybody has, a simple habit of like uh, having tea. Okay. Now, I I I uh, have tea every day. So. i want to like reduce first of all the consumption of tea and then get rid of that habit and then i try to do that but what happens is when i do it i feel because it's an habit it is it is a habit for a long period of time so when i feel one thing i do is i don't dwell on past mistakes so if something goes wrong 
and I am not able to overcome a particular thing, uh, usually people get a uh, guilt, you know, uh, and this guilt actually takes them more uh, regressive. What I try to do internally is accept that mistake, uh, build upon it, and do not take, uh, you know, do not take a setback as a part of like a guilt that you see that comes up. So this is one thing I do. Uh, in a particular, uh, you can say habit that has been uh, problematic for me, uh, not able to do is like, I observed in my own self uh, aspect is like, I had this habit of procrastination for a while. And uh, breaking through this was a difficult task because I had this feeling of entitlement that uh, I was able to do things on before time uh, with a short duration, I can, you know, take up a lot, lot of stress, uh, perform under stress and then get it done before time, you know, on time, you can say. But it was closer to the deadlines, closer to the goals. Whereas a good habit would have been like, you know, doing it before that. I, I, I find some success in that uh, direction, but this is one of, the, one of the challenges I often have been facing. Apart from a lot of good things that have been there, this has been also the you know, difficult part that often you find is difficult to understand that I'm going through this. And once you've identified, it's also more difficult to like overcome. Coming back, you did mention the word failure and you also mentioned the word that you sleep it out and uh, come out of the challenges. So do you have any failure story? Uh, that you that is worth talking about that you that you want people to know uh, as far as professional endeavors are concerned uh, i have been into what i am since the beginning so and it's a, it's a building story so i would say that it's still on the on the way uh, and looking forward for a good thing in the personal at the personal level i and which everybody does uh, have i see a a challenge uh, that struck me was relating to the nature I carry and uh, the setback that I receive. And this, this, this usually is difficult to overcome. Mm. I would say, but because we are, I come from a psychology as a background and psychology as a thing. Uh, you see, I see this as a failure. What? Uh, it's a small thing when you find. Uh, you trust people, you have this understanding that you have uh, the, the ability to trust someone mm -hmm. and you know that person has a credibility and uh, credentials and abilities and all those things to sustain your trust. And you know that for a long period of time, then you find suddenly not uh, an act of distrust, but you find that you are, you are, you are, uh, your capability to trust has been so much so that uh, uh, something deviation from what it is, you find it difficult to reconcile. When when I tried it with uh, you know uh, some of my patients, for example, like uh, trusting them towards adopting certain change, mm -hmm. insightful change in their behavior, and because I trust humans, because I trust. Mm. individuals because minds or humans tend to grow they do not tend to involute mm. uh, i find it tricky yet sometimes that how human mind functions and it turns on itself and restricts that growth or resist so when i see this element of trust while you are see, you see that the other person should built upon. I see this as a little bit of failure in terms of my professional capacity. How to navigate between the highest of, highest value system, that is, let's say in this case, trust. And then you see a, the implication relating to human mind, which is a trickster. And then uh, if you have to devise a mechanism where these two systems should fit in, I haven't been able to come to that terms as of now. It's difficult. Why, why, do you, why do you call it as a failure? Uh, I I see because uh, in, in a professional setting, for example, uh, 
our objective is to see that uh, the individual seeking help has to be like given help mm. and suffering is one such thing uh, in this space it's very difficult to gauge for example if you look at a person who is suffering from sadness is it easy to see sadness but you look at a person who is suffering from self reproach or lack of confidence often it is an understanding that the other person tries to pin up the blame upon that person that you are not doing enough mm. but if you look at the constructs why this come up in a very uh, you know uh, familial or maybe a societal context it's very easy to see that let's i'll give an analogy for example someone breaks up someone's hand and it is because of xyz reason it's usually our understanding that the mistake is not with that individual the broken arm is the victim is the victim so you actually empathize with that person whosoever whatsoever is the cause and you say get well soon does that not happen with the fractured confidence right and then you see here is a here is a catch you see if you try to make uh, the same understanding with a fracture arm to a fracture confidence you can do that and you see there and because confidence is an organel of say mind it mind has by its natural tendency is a trickster it will play out so it's very difficult and hence how to set up this mechanism and world over psychologists across globe you see sigmund freud you see carl jung adler viktor frankl have been trying to decode the facet of this you know this very organ that we call it as mind and wow. so very difficult to get into that thing fascinating it's wow okay <laughs> lot to absorb yeah 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 all right okay <laughs> so so in that context i see myself as a failure so get not getting the not able to get the hold of uh, the well, individual mind okay you can try you can succeed you can have look at the collective consciousness people have people have been trying to do it uh, physical sphere it's easy to you know negate or approximate that's fine but you look at the subtle spheres of mind and consciousness very difficult and if you don't get hold of it transformation is difficult correct right. itself good look into helping others difficult you did mention about collective consciousness but how important um, or it is important but how easy or difficult is mind control according to you so it's important first of all we admit that yeah uh difficult if you if, if your actions are not pure mm. easy when your actions are pure so your mind is turbulent so it's it's a very simple uh, you know connection in these two things let's understand people meditate mm. okay and meditation is essentially is to like still the mind correct and that is exactly what we see as mind control stillness of mind you know quieting the mind so people complain after some time like you know i've been practicing meditation for long and they are not able to quiet in the mind you know they have not got any success I'm part of it yeah I'm part so of that. why is it so <laughs> why is it so so if you look at the cause it's not about the practice practice may be good the practice is good okay what happens here is uh you fail to recognize with one internal instrument that is mind in your you know set of internal instruments as you see your body say let's say your body has got arms and legs and head and chest and all those things it's it's a unit of one body these are units of one body now related to the internal uh, you know we, we call this as antakkaran mm. so antakkaran has got in constituent elements like mind intellect consciousness ego mm. now you try to do it with mind you quite in the mind you're not able to do it because your consciousness has been you know colluding with it now you have to purify your consciousness and consciousness is into gets into purification state with certain factors like your actions service is good part you know you do some something as a part of service 
your consciousness starts getting pure. Pure in the sense it does not actually get into muddled thing. For example, eating good. You know, uh, eating good in the sense I would say the food which is the, uh, in Bhagavad Gita it's put put forth very nicely. The sattvic food that you see. Right. And then you have to think. Uh, so th thinking, if you look at thinking, thinking is a is an ability of your intellect. It has to little. It has a mind in a very lesser capacity can think. Major part of thinking is of your intellect. And what what your know, Western thinkers have done is uh, they have they are not able to put a distinction between mind and intellect. Whereas it's quite different. Like, you know the constructs are pretty different. So thinking has to be in a in a uh, way of thinking. If you look at thinking itself, it's a vector quantity. It's not a scalar. It has got intensity and a direction. So that aspect of thinking, you know, the direction has to be more optimistic, positive. And there has to be intensity in that direction. Mm. So frequency, I would call that. So once these things start happening. You see, your consciousness start getting into the the form that is more stable, pure, as we call it, okay. and then you see practice meditation on top of it, and you start quiet at the mind. So this is this has been so two different objects, or two different instruments, two different process of you know simplifying them. For meditation, for mind, it is meditation. For consciousness, it is uh, selfless yeah. service. Yeah. And what about the intellect? Intellect, uh, you have to. So intellect is a discriminatory thing. Okay? The basic, basic. Uh, if you see one quality of intellect is it has to be razor sharp. It has to be sharpened by and the, why sharpened because it can discriminate between right, wrong, good, bad, mm. all short, black, white. All those, you know, how you discriminate things, how you see. Things uh, into like dichotomy, okay? Um, not necessarily dichotomy, but how you can segregate the things, mm -hmm. and the things, you know, separate the things and see with clarity. In doing so, one practice helps is, uh, uh, you know, see again. You go back. Why we want to think in a particular way is it's it's because about uh, the understanding of reality that we have. Let's say something for you. Uh, you're looking at an object from the direction, maybe from west, and you see object that way. I look at it from east, and I see it this way. For me, this is the object yeah. that is your object, and both are true, both are real. Right. Okay. Now you look at it from top. Someone is looking at it from a 3D perspective. He has got a broader, you know, hold of a reality, sense of reality. So yours and mine uh, understanding is real, but are lower truth and someone looking at the 3d aspect of it a complete view has to do with the higher truth the same thing so that does not discard this so there is no true or false you can say or right or wrong it's lower and higher you can say okay. so our ability to sharpen this having getting that view which is complete that is one exercise that intellect has to do to sharpen it so typically, uh, they suggest reading up, right? So reading, reading and applied, yeah. So reading is one such exercise, which is mental gymnastics. So you actually go into a lot of past, future, present, imagination, you know, all those Visualization things. Visualization also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Visualization. You know, this, this is the exercise that can help. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Even those games, right? You have mental games like Sudoku or puzzles. Um, can they Absolutely. also be used to, to yeah. sharpen? So, so the other part of intellect, apart from being razor sharp and discriminatory, it has to be like uh, looking towards the uh, problem solving aspect and uh, looking towards a solution, uh, aggregating things and also like, you know, looking so uh, the logical aspect of it, you know, from bottom up to top down to formative and to all those aspects. So this various dimensions of intellect has to be sharper. And this comes with, see, thinking is one such thing which also expands 
the network of your neurons in your right. brain. By definition, your intellect or intelligence, which is an applied thing of what you say, intellect, which is what you can say, operationalizes your intellect, the intelligence. It uh, it is a directly proportional to the number of synaptic junctions you've got in your brain. So one trigger to this is uh, thinking. Awesome. Entrepreneur, and you've been an entrepreneur since the time you began, right? Uh, you've been a business owner. Um, is there any habit, a trait, or a skill? Uh, I know your your company's name is Trade Fit, but is there any habit, trait, or skill that you wish you had developed while you were young, or wish you develop even now? Okay, so one thing I see uh, challenging in the current times is because people usually do not subscribe to the uh, to the compassionate type of leadership model. Uh, it's very difficult because people have gotten into this habit of, uh, you know, someone must tell me something or someone must be behind me or for doing it, getting the things done, unless I'm motivated and inspired as an employee. Uh, it's difficult for me to get along with those, uh, uh, you know, those approaches of like being a hard leader. I don't know whether it, it is good or bad at this point of time, the, the, the journey that I am into. Uh, because when I look at the uh, when I look at the scenarios uh, post five or six or seven years when the team grows larger and all those things, uh, what really drives is uh, from when you look from the employee to employers uh, from bottom up approach, it's these qualities, the value system that really matters. And when you are very much exposed to your uh, employee uh, in, a, in a very D and in the small teams. I think uh, this feature of being a disciplined, although discipline is a part of my character, you say, but being hard on like, you know, people, it's, it's really been, you know, difficult for me to get into that mode. And this has been uh, one of the things uh, that because the ecosystem is such that people expect some kind of uh, uh, boundary is being set in order to perform. Uh, to get off that mindset that, you know, someone is there to take care of me, I have to do it on your own. It takes time for employee to get into that. And for, for that transformation, it, it is difficult for me to either bring them from that state to a state of self-motivation into inspiration. And uh, if that is not happening, how do I come up with a with a with a mentoring or maybe a leadership style which is more towards uh, emphasizing and getting things done? So that is a challenge. So you're talking about like creating accountability. Uh, you what can see the, from from the perspective of the employee, it's accountability, definitely. Yeah. So again, accountability as a subset of a owner. You know, right. ownership. Ownership, yeah. So here I see uh, you don't have to have in a, in a in an organization, in a small organization or maybe a mid-level organization. If you find you are able to infuse that ownership towards your employees, in the sense that you have with your own self, right. you will see that you'll navigate through the you know the the. The organization in a very simple way, like you know, you have that quality has been transferred as a part of your your maybe your leadership, your your states of thinking, your emotions being put to the employee. For me, right now, uh, because I said there's a difference in the ecosystem as such, people admire the larger organizations and the leadership there. Uh, looking from bottom up, but when it comes to own their own self, it becomes difficult for them to implement. So this has been a challenge. All right. What is your greatest or biggest learning so far in life? In life, as of now, I can say that uh, if you don't, if you don't have a purposeful life, uh, if you don't engage with the with the purpose, which is uh, not materialistic, it has to be material and intangible. Uh, you lose the train. You are losing the train already. So being purposeful, uh, having a purpose in life, meaning in life, 
for the sake of attainment, uh, which is more uh, subtle in nature, not the materialistic thing. That has to be there. I am blessed to get into that sense of being purposeful very early on in my life. And uh, I see that's, a, that's an achievement for me. Um, one last question to you. What is the future? Uh, how does your future, future look like? Uh, for yourself as well as for your uh, organization? <laughs> for my personal thing, I see a clear and maybe clear and maybe straight future leading towards a simplistic and un simplistic understanding of life, leading towards you know uh, attaining what is to be attained. As far as my organization is concerned, uh, I see we making a difference, I would say a dent somewhere in understanding of how perception relating to psychology has been built in modern modern context. We largely subscribe to an understanding which has been given to us from the European uh, standpoint. Uh, we have altogether not brought to the table the, the Indian perspective, the Eastern perspective of Blagic College. And in bringing so, we bring a dimension of positivity. For example, mindfulness is a great example for that kind. So we bring to the table to the to the to the modern community something which is more constructive than looking to the psychopathology of an individual, looking to the optimistic side of us of the mm. so the growth part of it. Yeah. That is where so, I see. Okay. So are they are they going to be any research papers or books yes, coming absolutely. up from you? So so we recently signed up a MOU with All India Institute of Ayurveda. Uh, Ministry of Ayush in developing one of the one of the very very niche tools of psychometry, which is measuring the three gunas and three doshas and panchakoshas based on wow. the panchakoshaduta theory. So awesome. we will be will be soon be coming up with the tool. The prototype is ready, although, uh, and uh, we'll be having a very strong implication of measurement of these dimensions of personality and using it into the corporate world. That's that's the object. Yeah. Wonderful. And probably some books you're you're going to author. Because we need to beat Sigmund Freud, right? So yeah. <laughs> so there's a perspective that I would want to give it to the world in terms of the Indic uh, version of psyche. And there has been a couple of attempts been done uh, with the conglomerate of authors coming together in the handbook of Indian psychology and the methods of Indian psychology and all those things. So. Uh, my endeavor would be putting it in perspective the holistic understanding of mind, limiting it to the repercussions of mind and not all the constructs of you know psychology per se, which includes intellect, consciousness, and all those things. My my endeavor would be first getting into the nitty-gritties of mind from an Indic perspective. So that's 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 how awesome. Awesome. Looking forward to reading that yes, yes. and uh, getting more knowledge from you. Thank, Thank you. you so very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.